Rest of you can turn with me in your Bibles, the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 18 and 19 is where I'm going to be today. I forgot you're in sixth grade now. You don't go to kids church anymore. All right. I was wondering why my son was still sitting there. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. I just woke up today. I can't really explain it. I just woke up today, Miguel, and I just, I, I got like three text messages of people sending me texts and they're saying that they're praying for me. My childhood pastor, when I was a little boy, he's the head pastor of New Spring Church on K96 and 21st in Wichita. He sent me a text this morning. I just felt like God wants to do something special in this place today. Today, three years ago, today, uh, three years ago, I was living in Derby. Uh, I, uh, Anthony, I've been ordained since 2012. I was at my other home church for 13 years, thought I'd be there my whole life. But Anthony, three years ago today, I was going through a time of silence and waiting from the Lord, and I waited for three years. There's something to be said about waiting. And I want to give all praise and glory to God because I wouldn't have waited had he not stepped in many times or reminded me and said, wait. Three years ago today, I had no idea God's direction of my life for ministry. One of the things I've seen that I think people need to be very cautious of, you better be careful about aspirations in ministry. The Bible teaches in Hebrews, no man takes this calling to himself. Welcome to 2023, the ministry of America. Everyone takes this calling to their self, the fivefold ministry. This is what I am. You better be careful. Because let me tell you something, the anointing and the power and the blessing comes from what God's called you to do. I didn't save me. I didn't ask me to preach. I didn't make me the associate pastor at my church. I didn't tell me to move to Winfield. Really, I was in this place, Miguel, three years ago where I knew that God had called me to preach. I'd been to the Philippines. As an associate pastor, I preached weekly for years. But I didn't know, God, do you want me to be an associate, a head pastor? Do you want me to be an evangelist, a missionary? God, what do you want from me? And I'd waited for three years. Three years ago today, I was still living in Derby. Three years ago today, my old boss, I hadn't worked for him for years, he had called me because his manager was on vacation and he asked me to watch the store at 6th and Main in Winfield, Kansas, Gaston's Floor Covering. I knew him because I managed that store from 2011 to 2015 while I still lived in Derby. But I hadn't worked for him in years. August 13th of 2020, three years ago today, I was watching the store in Winfield, Kansas. Before I came down to Winfield, God said, spoke to me and said, I'm going to show you something when you go to Winfield next week. I didn't know what it was. Three years ago today, it was a Thursday, God called me to be a head pastor. And two days later, God confirmed it and told me on that Saturday to leave Derby, to pack up my home and to move to Winfield, Kansas and start a church in my house. I went home three years ago today. Me and my wife started packing. Everybody thought we were crazy. We had no denomination, no church backing, nothing and nobody behind us other than God himself. We moved down here. We lived here by October 16th, two months. We moved down here and October 25th, this church started in my house. This coming October 25th will be our three year anniversary. I just want to stop and give praise and glory and honor to God for what he has done, for who he is. He has been moving. He has been working like I've never seen. And I absolutely want to boast in the Lord because I want to tell you something. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I have no degrees. I have no seminary. I barely got my high school diploma because the judge made me from the alternative school when I was 21 or 22. I am an absolute nothing and nobody. And without the anointing and listen to me, listen to me, sometimes church people who know this lingo and it goes in, in ear in one ear and out the other, without the Holy Ghost. 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 I have a ghost inside of me. That's what changed me. 
That's how I got off of that cocaine and meth and ecstasy and getting sl slaughtered drunk and smoking pot. Yes, smoking pot is sin and wrong. Amen, Branson. I'll amen myself. Don't worry about that. God saved me and pulled me from the darkness. He called me here and I want to give all praise and glory to God. Without his Holy Ghost, without his Holy Spirit, everybody listen to me. Without him this morning, nothing will happen. But I've been praying and begging God and I'm going to stop and pray. And I want to ask you to praise the Lord with me. I want to ask you to pray with me. Because look at me, I desperately need the Lord this morning. And I don't want to leave here. We didn't show up to go through uh, a bunch of traditions or a bunch of religious motions. We have shown up to worship in here from heaven. Amen. Amen. Would you please do me a favor? Would you please, when I'm praying, will you ignore me and not listen to me? Will you actually kneel and actually pray with me? Will you do that? Yes. If you're going to do that with me, give me an amen. amen. Thank you. Let's pray.
if you are able, please stand with me as we honor the reading of the Word of God. Today I'm going to be in Genesis 18 and Genesis 19. Today I am preaching on Sodom and Gomorrah. I didn't figure anybody would get excited about that. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah, I've heard preachers and ministries and people over the years say, oh, I don't want none of that fire and brimstone preaching. Here's what I've always thought to myself. Well, what are you doing with these passages then? Are you just leaving that part of the Bible out? You know what's incredible that I learned in studying this text? Sodom and Gomorrah, this story is mentioned like 20, 30 plus other times in the Bible. Nine or ten times is it mentioned in the New Testament. Jesus himself talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me read to you some stuff real quick. Look at uh, Isaiah 1.9 and Isaiah 3.9 quickly. Isaiah 1.9 and 3.9 very quickly. Isaiah 1.9 says, If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Isaiah 3, 9. For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Jeremiah 23, 14. Je Isaiah, Jeremiah. I'm singing the song from when I was a kid. That's how I know the books of the Bible. Amen. Isaiah, excuse me, what I say? Thank you. Jeremiah 23, 14. But in the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his evil. All of them have become like Sodom to me and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. 2 Peter 2, 6 and Jude 7. 2 Peter 2, 6. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, if he rescued righteous Lot, boy, if it wouldn't have said righteous Lot, I would have known, Matt, if he was righteous Lot. And greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment to the day of judgment. Jude 7. There's only one chapter in Jude, so when you hear Jude 7, that means Jude verse 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, served as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. And let's look at Jesus in Luke 17, verse 28. Luke 17, verse 28. Luke 17, 28, likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. Jesus is referring to his coming back. Planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out of Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. Everybody look here. Don't forget, this is Jesus, infinite love, telling us to remember Sodom and Gomorrah. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who's in the field not turn back. Re listen to this verse. It's going to be important later. Remember Lot's wife. Jesus said that. Jesus reminded us of Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus, infinite love, said, remember Lot's wife. And then I want you to see something. I didn't plan on going there, but I better go there. If you study history, look at Romans chapter 1, I think. If you study history, everybody listen to me. All sin is sin. 
Everybody listen to me. God loves everyone equally. Everybody listen to me. Everyone equally has been, has had the price paid on the cross. God loves everyone equally. And all sin, he commands everyone everywhere to turn and repent. It's all sin and wrong. Drunkenness, adultery. The Pharisees that rejected Christ to his face, the number one tool in the hand of Satan is a bunch of religious fakes. It always has been. Guess what? Jesus actually told them that they weren't going where he was going. They were literally, he was telling them they were going to burn in hell. There's a dark place in hell for a bunch of religious fakes. If you want to look what I'm about to read to you, the downfall of a society, I'm going to show you from scripture and I'm going to tell you a little bit about from history. The downfall of a society one of the ending downfall is when a society is actually promoting sin and evil and promoting homosexuality. Romans chapter one, verse, let me just start in 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, nor am I. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. You want to know if God has blessed a ministry? Do you want to know if God has blessed a church? Do you want to know if God's hand is on a church and on a ministry? Souls will be saved because I can't do that and neither can you. Only God can produce life-giving fruit. If a church is promoting gifts and not promoting the fruit, beware, watch out. Be careful. If a church is going around promoting the gifts of the Spirit and there's no soul saved and there's no spiritual fruit, watch out and be careful. You will know them by their fruits, not their gifts. Janez and Jambres, the dark magicians that opposed Moses, did the gifts. Gifts that are being promoted over fruit and over the salvation and the work of the ministry, listen to me. That's got, I got a red flag all over that because I've read this book. The power of God of salvation to everyone who believes. That's called equality. For the, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God. Well, Branson, wait a minute. What about those people that don't know? What about this? What about that? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Oh, some of it. All oh, the wrath of God. It is revealed. All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. There goes everybody's excuse. There it goes, it's gone. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Well, what about this? What about that? What about this? Listen, go argue with God. They're without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. This was me. Thought I was saved. Thought I was born again. My foolish heart was darkened. When people challenged me in my dark life, I would say stuff like this. Congratulations, must be nice to be Jesus Christ. Thanks for being judgmental. Everybody listen to me. I know that you've heard that. And some of you in here said that. Listen to me. That is poisonous evil from the pits of hell. Huh. Josh, I thought I was saved. Oh, who are you to be my judge? 
I'm not your judge. God's a judge. He'll judge me. Look at me. Yes, he will. That ought to terrify you. Well, you're not the judge. I'm not the judge. I've been sent ahead as an ambassador to proclaim the will of my king from his kingdom. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, look at me, things are getting darker and worse as we read. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged, na exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Have you read the suicide rate of people who are homosexual and transgender? My heart goes out to them. I've stood under a noose before and hated myself. Why? Because I was condemned because of my dark lifestyle. I didn't struggle with that particular sin, but what's it matter? All sin is sin. You want to know why they struggle with that? Receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Because we all have a conscience. I don't have time to talk about the conscience today. Well, it's because people don't accept them. Are you kidding me? It's accepted and exalted like never before. You want to be popular at school? Do you want to have nobody question you about anything? Just go tell them you're gay. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers. Haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Welcome to our society. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. I'm going to read to you something out of Corinthians. Matt Stevenson, would you please tell me the scripture where it says, and such were some of you? No, it's, a, it's from Corinthians. I know that. You're going to see the secrets of the preacher. Don't worry about this. And such were some of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What was that, brother? Thank you. First Corinthians, uh, I'm going to start back a little bit further. Uh, first Corinthians 6, verse, yes, verse 9, thank you. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, that means people who are having sex outside of marriage, or, nor idolaters, that's people that put things above God, anything. You think it's a statue that you're worshiping. You might put your phone as more important than God. That's called idolatry. I'm not saying your phone is sin and wrong. I just use mine. It's a great tool. Anything that comes before God is an idol in your life. Nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves. Now remember, those who do these things will not go to heaven. They won't inherit the kingdom of God. Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards. Branson, are you just calling out one group of people? No. Listen to all this. Sinners, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revivalers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, everybody listen. Here's the good part where you get to do an amen. And such were some of you. 
but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. When it says such were some of you, he's talking about Branson Nicholas Sears. Such was some of I. I was wicked. I was in the darkness. And God saved me and washed me and changed my life. Is there anybody in the house of God that can say, that was me? I've been saved. Yeah. Boy, that was weak. Yeah. I'll give you one more chance. Is there anybody that's been saved? Yeah. I wanted to read all of those to you because I wanted you to know how important these texts are. And I know it's been heavy, but I believe it's going to get a little bit lighter. Here's what I want you to see this morning. Everybody listen up. I want you to see this morning God's love and his mercy and his grace through the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. I want you to see how much God loves us and warns us and cares about us. And we're going to see the story of two characters. I want to ask everybody in this room. I want to ask teenagers, friends, young people, don't be talking. Don't be moving around. I want you to pretend like when you go to the theater and you went pee twice because you don't want to miss the movie. I want you to have that much respect for the God himself when he's moving. I want to ask everybody to pay attention. Don't talk. Stay off your cell phone and do not dishonor the spirit of the living God. Is that okay with you? Amen. Anyways, back to what I was saying. I don't like to say that stuff because it throws me off track which is what those things do. It hinders the spirit of God. And I don't ever, ever take that lightly. Today, we're going to see the story, Braylon, of two Christians, one named Abraham and one named Lot. And today, we're going to learn about God's love and his grace and mercy. Amen. Father, have your way. Please finish what you've started. Please carry me. Please hold me. Please minister, move. Please let faith arise. Please change eternity, save souls. Please have your way. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. you may be seated. You thought you were standing a long time, didn't you? I want you to see the warnings of this. Genesis chapter 18 and verse 1. And the Lord appeared to him. This is God appearing to Abraham. We're kind of right in the middle of the story of Abraham, the father of faith. He's been called from the land of Ur. God has changed his life. And uh, God is uh, ministering to him and speaking to him. When I teach you this morning, I'm not going to teach you about Hebrew. I'm not going to teach you about Greek. I'm not going to teach you about the land of Ur, that they believe he was an idol maker. I'm not going to teach you any of those things. I'm going to teach to you the word of God through a spiritual lens. It's a spiritual book. And I want you to learn in the spirit world. Somebody give me an amen. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of memory, and he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of day. There's going to be two contrasts here today. A visitation with Abraham and a visitation with Lot. First and foremost, when did God come and visit Abraham? During the daytime. It's a picture of Abraham. Two stories here today. Abraham walks in the light. Abraham walks in the day. Abraham, the father of faith. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and three men. How many? were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth, excuse me, and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. For while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. I want you to see something very quickly that if you're a born again Christian that you can learn from Abraham. He was a servant. He wasn't, a, this was not a poor man. I believe he had great wealth. He had many servants. We're going to see in a little bit when he gets food, he has one of the young men prepare the food. I want you to see that he ran, and this is actually, we're going to see here in a little bit revealed. This is actually pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. This is Jesus coming down before he came in the flesh. Jesus is in the Old Testament many times. He met with Joshua and had a sword in his hand. He met with Samson's parents. This was pre-incarnate Jesus with two angels. Abraham sees them and he runs to them and views himself as a servant. This is a man of authority. This is a man of great wealth. Everybody listen to me. If you want to learn from Abraham, the father of faith, 
If you want to be called, there's only one person in the Bible that is called a friend of God. Guess who it is? Abraham. And you know what he did? He viewed himself as a servant and went and humbled himself. If you want to do something for God, you're going to have to learn to humble yourself. You know, Anthony, in 2017, I'd been preaching for, I'd been saved for 10 years. God had his hand on my ministry. I was an associate pastor. I had done all these things. When 2017, when they came and said, we don't believe God's called you to be the associate pastor anymore. You're still ordained. You're still on the board and these other things. I felt betrayed and didn't know what God was doing. People thought there was some grievous sin in my life. People asked, people thought I'd gone and looked at pornography. Anthony, I never did that. People thought I'd committed adultery. Anthony, I never did that. People thought I was in some gross sin. You know what? I didn't know. But something God revealed to me later. I was in gross sin. It was called pride. Spiritual pride is blinding. And God grind me to powder in 2017 and said, Branson, I don't need you for nothing. That was the preparation for me to move, for me to wait in three years of silence before I'd move and start this church. Excuse me, God started this church. We need more people to view themselves as servants. This is, I hope you hear my heart, this is not about condemnation. I'm going to use this and say this. We need more people serving at Faith Ignited. My wife is not in service today. I was excited. I felt like she was supposed to be in service today. My wife doesn't get to be in service very often. She runs our entire children's department. She's our church administrator. She's our church secretary. And today she's running the nursery because we didn't have anybody. I felt like my wife was supposed to be in here today. The first, we're two and a half years old. The first like year and a half, she was never in a service. We've grown to a place, I believe we're 150, 160 on a Sunday morning. This is not about condemnation. I'm sharing with you a very real need as the pastor of Faith Ignited Church. We need some more help. I need some more people to serve. If you don't want to do it, please don't do it. I'm looking for people that want to be like Father Abraham. I've been serving Anthony since I got saved. No one had to tell me to come to church. No one had to beg me. I was honored to hold the door. I was honored to clean the toilet. I was honored to show up and be in the house of God and to serve my master. And if we can get disciples and born again Christians to view themselves as serving him, that's what will happen. And that's what we need to do, Anthony. He served. He served. Verse 4, let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servants. So they said, do as you have said. Verse 6, and Abraham went quickly to the tent of Sarah and said, quick, three seas of fine flour, knead it and make your cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and calf that he had prepared. Boy, I'm getting hungry already, amen. And sat it before them and stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. The Lord said, the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham... And Sarah were old and advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, am I worn out and my Lord is old? Shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too difficult for our God. She heard, uh, she heard literally the Lord himself talk about some things in the future that was going to happen. And she laughed. Braylon, when we moved down here three years ago, we moved and started this service in my house. You were there. I thought we'd be in my house for about a year. We were in our home having church for five weeks. Do you remember one time we dismissed children's church in our house and mom was upstairs with all the kids and someone cut her hair? Okay. Boy, we had to get a building. 
There was one, we, had, we met in my house for five weeks and nothing wrong with starting a church in a house, nothing. <laughs> if that church don't grow out of that house, I got questions about what's happening in that house. A church is either growing or it's dying. Anthony, before I moved here, I did a three day fast and the second night I laid down on my head at 1019 Post Oak and Derby. I laid down my head on the second night of the fast and God said this, don't worry about a building, I already got it for you. When we moved here, this church was Aviator. They had put 300 grand into the building, the life they had done all this. God told me to go rent from here. And here's what God said. That building right there, you don't need to go tell them, but it's yours, I've given it to you. Are you guys cold in here in the back? You are, all right. Sorry, I see some people act like they're freezing cold. Anthony, hey, will you do me a favor? Jared's got it, thank you. Dude, I got sweaty, Jared, and I turned it way down. Just put the two, Jared, would you do me a favor? Put the two sanctuary ones on 68 or 69. I just figured I'd let it get freezing and ask for forgiveness later, amen? <laughs> I don't know why I get so sweaty when I preach. Anyways, is there anything too hard for the Lord? God told me, I, I wasn't supposed to, Matt, I know you guys were here at Aviator and I didn't come announce it when I met with you and the, the pastor that day. God had already told me, Branson, this building's yours, I've given it to you. You know, if I would have gone and told everybody that, it would have sounded crazy. I want to say this this morning. Is there anything too difficult for the Lord? God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or imagine. Some of you have things going on in your life right now and I don't know nothing about it. Listen to me. Listen to the word of God. Is there anything too difficult for the Lord? Let me tell you something. He can make a way. He can change things. Braylon, the first miracle that Jesus did was turn water to wine. You know what I take away from that? Jesus changes things. Jesus changes things. God can change your life, your story. God can change what's going on. Amen. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I'll return to you about this time next year. And Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. You know, sometimes we think, oh, well, God's not that blunt. Oh, well, God's not that sharp in his dealings. A few weeks ago, we're in Mark 3, and I read to you where it says, Jesus looked around in the church and looked around at them with anger. Listen to this. This is Jesus sitting here. She said, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. She said, I didn't laugh. Jesus said, no, you did laugh. Then the men set out from there and looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham, this is so intimate. Pay attention. Two stories today. This is Jesus with Abraham. Went with them to, on their way. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? I wrote a note in my Bible. God shared his plans of judgment with his friend Abraham. I saw recently on Facebook, there was in Wichita, some lady coming who's a psychic or, or something like that. I can't remember what it is. Everybody listen to me. Don't you ever contact a psychic, a medium. That's witchcraft. It's evil. It's rebellion. It opposes God. And let me tell you something. Only God himself knows the future. I've seen those people and they do have magic, dark arts, and they can tell you the past. Because I believe the evil knows the past and through their dark magic can tell you the past. Everybody listen to me. There's not a devil. There's not a demon. There's not a witch, a medium, a psychic. No one knows the future but God himself. My daughter the other night, Braylon, I was praying with Della. She said, uh, check the closet. She said, Daddy, I'm scared of the dark. I said, baby doll, don't be scared of the dark because Jesus is inside of me and the dark is scared of Jesus. If I was going to make a horror movie for the demons, it'd be called Jesus. <laughs> Boy, I didn't plan on preaching on that. By the way, don't you ever go and invite and entertain yourself, your children, or your family with horror movies. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. I'm not going to share a lot of details because I ain't trying to make the hair of people's arms stand up, but let me tell you something. I've seen demonic possession. It is real. My first 10 days in Winfield, I got called to a house. 
I'm not going to tell you what I saw. But I'm going to tell you what happened afterwards. It was gone. Why? Because I have been given the power to trample over serpents and scorpions. Nothing by any means will harm me. You know, I work at Dave Gaston's store sometimes. Anthony, it's not my store. I don't own the carpet. I don't own the store. None of it's mine. But you know what? I know the authority that my master, that my boss has given me. I know his authority. If he needs something, if I want to change the price, if I want to do this, there's certain levels where I don't have to ask him. I can do it, and it's my authority. I can say it. I can do it. I can change the price. I can get the shot truck. I can do it. Because I know what my boss has told me, and I know the authority he's vested in me. None of it's mine. Dave owns his own store. God's blessed him. God saved Dave Gaston th almost 30 years ago. He's an alcohol gambling at the casino. By the way, don't get drunk and don't go gamble at the casino. That's good preaching right there. Don't go to the devil's playground. Some Christians need to rise up and know the authority that God has given you. But we're going to see two stories today of Abraham and Lot. Some Christians walk intimately here with Jesus. And some Christians live with their leg and their arm and they're, they're on the fence and they have no power and they wonder why everybody else lives and walks in power. There are some folks that go enter into the book of Joshua, Anthony. They live and walk in victory. They're slaying giants. They live in revival. Some folks are like whiny children walking in circles in the wilderness, being fed their bread, their manna. And they're whining and they're complaining and they're ruled by anxiety and fear and depression and they walk in a dry place in circles. Anthony, we're trying to get some Christians to cross over to the stinking other side. Amen. Verse 18, seeing that Abraham shall surely, uh, verse 17, the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? God can show his servants what he's about to do. God can give vision. I believe he gives his bishops the New Testament word that we see, pastor, 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 it's only actually once. That word actually, Josh, is bishop, overseer, oversight. God gives oversight to his overseer, bishop. I've seen people question that. Then you don't understand God's word and his calling. There's things that I see and know. Anyways. He's going to show Abraham what I'm about to do. Seeing that Abraham, verse 18, shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Listen to him, every man of God in this room. Every husband and every father. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. The promises and the power and the presence come when men stand up and serve God. When men stand up and are men when men stand up and sing and worship and praise the Lord. Braylon, I'm so stinking manly. I can worship and put my hands in the air. I'm so manly. I can put my face on the floor. I'm so manly. I can shout and sing to the Lord. I'm so manly. I don't have to have somebody babysit me and tell me to be faithful to the house of God because I've read the word. I'm so manly, I don't got to argue like a child and a teenager and tell spiritual authority what I'm not going to do. I'm so manly, I can be faithful to the house of God. I'm manly enough, Josh, I can humble myself. I'll die into self. You know when I get wrong? I don't brush it under the mat. You know what I say, Josh, when I get it wrong with my wife? You know what I say when I get it wrong? Braylon, you bear witness right now. When I get it wrong, I say, I was wrong, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Huh. Some men in here, you need to learn to do that. You need to be man enough to do that. 
Why, men? Because we've been chosen. We've been chosen to lead by being a servant and pointing our kids to Jesus Christ. We don't have enough men being faithful to the simple things God's called us to do. I have to actually teach people who are Christians that they have to follow the word of God and do the things that he's called us to do. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Braylon, I got grown men that have been saved longer than you've been alive that want to argue with me about being faithful to the house of God. Mind-blowing, isn't it? It's mind-blowing to you, son, because you know what the word of God says. Son, there's going to come a day. Believe it or not, you're almost 12, and most of your years under my roof, you ain't going to be, you ain't going to be, you ain't going to be 30 years old living in the basement. I know you're not, because I know God has his hand on your life. I'm going to do my best to point you, to raise you, to be a man, to work and provide. You're going to have a family of your own. And dude, I love you, and I've got your back. Verse 20, then the Lord said, because the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come. And if not, I will know. God is going to tell Abraham what his plans are. Jesus hung back while the angels kept going and is going to tell Abraham his future plans. I'm going to get reamed for this again, but I'm going to do it anyways. In June was Pride Month, and our city, downtown on Maiden Street, decided to exalt evil and exalt wickedness and promote it and glorify it. That night, I got ticked off. I took this flag and I walked around this church property. You think I'm weird? I don't care, I think you're weird. I walked around this church property, I was ticked. Be angry and said not. Sometimes we ain't angry enough over evil and wickedness, being promoted to our children, our families, our homes. The devil knows. There's things that God has ordained and organized. Church, government, and home. The most important is the home, Josh, because if the devil can destroy the home of America, the church and the government will fall. Welcome to the church. Welcome to America in 2023. I done walked around this property just like this. People thought I was weird. I didn't care. I walked around and prayed. A couple men came up here and joined me, and we prayed. I felt like that night God told me, and I almost posted on Facebook, and you're going to have to forgive me. I became a coward, and I didn't. If you look at the scriptures I posted from that post, I said, I'm praying for Winfield tonight. And then I posted the verse about when God sent the plague in Exodus. When I said I was praying for Winfield, I felt like God told me that night that there was going to be a tornado or some sort of natural disaster in Winfield. And I prayed for our city and I posted verses about the plague coming. That's what I meant. I felt like I was supposed to declare it and prophesy it, Anthony, more clearly. By the way, New Testament, do not despise prophecies. I felt like God told me to say it. So I just posted it the way I did. That was Cowley County Pride event. Guess what happened on the Friday night of Cowley County Fair? That dark storm just came out of nowhere. Branson, you really believe God showed you that? Yes, I do. Couldn't help but think the timing of it. The Cali County Pride event, and it happened during the town's Cali County Fair. This year in October, I decided to change the name of the camp meeting. Brady, this year in October, our revival is called Cali County Revival.
God told Abraham, his friend, what he was about to do. Verse 22, so the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood still before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 persons within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put righteous to death and the wicked, so that the righteous fares the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I found 45 there. Verse 27, excuse me, 29. Again, he said to him, uh, spoke to him and said, Suppose 40 are there. And he answered, For the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, I will not let... Oh, let not the Lord be angry, I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do if I find 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, oh, not, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Would you please start the prayer music, brother? I want you to see something about the friend, God's friend, Abraham. You think that your prayers don't matter? They do. You think your request won't change anything? This was written Jared, it says in the New Testament, these things were written for our instruction, for our learning. I read earlier several times. I, I mean, it's quoted so many times, the story. Look at me. Your prayer matters. Some of you, you're not even praying about it. Some of you need help and you got a lot going on and you don't know what to do. And you can share it with me and share it with your friends and share it with everybody else. And you've not even opened your mouth and shared it with God. Guys, I don't understand it all. I do know this. Our prayers matter. Pray about it. Second story. I'm going to do this one much quicker, Jared. Genesis 19. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening. Wait a minute. The Lord and two angels came when? During the daytime. Lot walks in the evening. Lot walks in the darkness. Angels show up and they're, they're going to give him a warning. We're going to see some good things. Jesus didn't come and show up at Lot's house. I preached Psalm 34 Wednesday night and God moved in a special way, Anthony. I'm just going to say this for sake of time. You study Psalm 34. It matters who you are and what we do. I can't, I can't pass that. I'm gonna read something to you very quickly from Psalm 34. Psalm 34, 12. What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Who wants to see good? Who wants to see life? Who wants to see a blessing? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, that cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Brady, this last two and a half years, I've never felt more hated and rejected in my entire life, never. I've also never felt more loved and felt the presence of God in my life like I have this last two and a half years. Jesus didn't show up in Lot's house. You want the presence of God? Seek the Lord. Get off the fence. Quit walking in circles. 
Verse 19, verse 1, when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. By where he's sitting, by judging where he's sitting, he, Lot may have been the mayor or the judge or some high prominent official because he was sitting at the city gate. They said, no, we'll spend the night in the town square, but he pressed them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread. And they are, listen, and they ate, excuse me. Listen, this is Abraham's nephew. And I already read to you from the New Testament it says righteous lot. So we're talking about two Christians here. We're gonna see the difference of these guys' lives and their impact. You know, God, you know, Abraham, uh, Matt, God showed me this while studying. Abraham influenced God. The world influenced Lot. But before they lay down, verse four, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, this is how bad it is, surrounded the house and they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out here that we may know them. Lot went out for the men at the entrance, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any men. Disgusting. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Good gravy, Lot. What disgusting wickedness. This is what happens when Sodom and Gomorrah, this is what happens when the world infiltrates Christians thinking. This is what happens when Christians don't serve God. They don't have his presence. Oh, I don't need his church. I'm this. Oh, I, don't, I don't need to be faithful. I don't need to do this. What you do matters. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn and he has become the judge. This dude ain't from around here. Now he's judging us. Brady, I done heard that since I moved to Winfield. This guy ain't even from around here. He came here to be our judge. No, I came here to preach and say, thus saith the Lord. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Don't ever think. Don't ever think if you give in to the world that they're gonna go, oh, okay, now it's okay. Listen to me. People aren't the enemy and we war not according to the flesh. Let me tell you something. Darkness is not going to make a treaty with you. If you stand in truth and love, Jesus' infinite love was murdered, tortured, and hung on a tree. I don't wanna be hated. I don't want people to come against me. And I'm not going to back down to the bullies saying all these fake things about me. You need to know this. It's not the goal to have people hate you. It's not the goal. It's not the goal. It's not what we want. Jesus couldn't get away from the hatred of the world. And he taught us many times, why do you think that you can? You won't. Because when you stand on truth and love like Jesus did, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. And he said, I believe in John 15 or 16, these things I have written, I'm paraphrasing, that you may know that you won't stumble. I've told you ahead of time. Don't be surprised, Second, first, second Peter, don't be surprised at the fiery trial that's come upon you. The world will hate you. And it's not the goal. I don't want anybody to hate me. We ought to have a good testimony with outsiders. Brady, years ago at our other church, there was a guy that was openly homosexual. Openly. Still is. He knew what I believed. He sat down and talked to me. And he came and heard me preach. And he went with our other church on an actual ski trip. You guys have heard the way I've preached today. He heard this and he spent time with me. We talked one-on-one. -on -one. He went with our church on the ski trip. Do you think that that guy thought that I hated him and our church hated him? No, because people know when you care about him. And you know what? I did care about him. And I had lots of good talks with him. And he knew the word that I stood and preached on. Brady, when we were teenagers, 
after we'd left Messiah when we were kids, that church we went to in Derby was a bunch of religious fakes. I was able to sit and talk to this guy and tell him, hey, religious fakes are the number one tool in the hand of Satan. It's always been that way. He knew that we didn't hate him and he knew we cared about him. Look at me, we can stand and preach the truth in love. We can tell them the truth and know them know that we care about them. Well, Branson, you seem hard sometimes in church. Judgment begins in the house of God. That's what the Bible teaches. So anyways, I'm almost done. Uh, verse 10, the, the men reached their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, and they wore themselves out groping for the door. These angels literally struck these men with blindness. If you're able, would you please stand with me all over this room? Verse 12, then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here, son-in-laws, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of the place, for we're about to destroy this place. Because the outcry of its people has become great over the Lord, and the Lord has sent to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his son-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, these are men that are about to marry his daughters, up, get out of this place, for the Lord's about to destroy it. Listen to Lot's testimony. I hope this isn't yours. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. They didn't take him serious. Some of you live so close to the world, nobody takes your faith serious. Nobody takes your faith serious. Look at his influence on the people. Look what he said about his daughters. As morning dawned, the angels urged, saying, up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. I'm gonna come back to all this. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand and the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside of the city. For sake of time, Lot argues with them and begs to go to another small town. They're clearly warned, do not look back from these angels. Look at verse 23. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zor. Then the Lord rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the city and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Verse 29, so it was when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. Braylon, bring me my towel quick. Thank you, son. Look back. It says, but he lingered. I had a bunch of scriptures I was going to give you, and for sake of time, I'm not going to. I want you to read later Ezekiel 33 11, Isaiah 55, 2 Peter 3 9. I'm going to read one of them. 2 Peter 3 9. Eight. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. This is what all the scriptures I was going to give you, they all sum up what I'm about to read. As some count slowness, slowness but is patient toward you. Listen to what God says. Not wishing that any. Let me say any. any. Not wishing that any should perish but that all, somebody say all. all. God says he wishes that all should reach repentance. God doesn't wish that anybody perish. I could read many more scriptures on that. God doesn't wish that anyone perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Listen to this preacher. I have been sent here on a mission. Judgment is coming to Winfield, Kansas, to America, to our world. The Bible teaches it will be burned up with fire. My king is coming back. And all those that don't repent 
will perish, will burn in a real place called hell. And God loves you and doesn't want you to go there. So much so that He sent His Son to die in your place. I would not send my oldest firstborn son to die for anybody. I would die before I allowed my son to die. God gave his best. Jesus gave his best. God doesn't desire that any should perish. Listen to what it says here. But he lingered. This, I'm talking to church people for a moment. Some of you, your life and your faith are like Lot. You're lingering. We're supposed to be ambassadors. You think I'm in ministry? You're in ministry. It says so in Ephesians. My job's to prepare you, child of God. What does your ministry look like? Are you lingering? Do people take your faith seriously? Does your life speak faithfulness? Does your life speak, I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my soul? Does your life speak, I'm born again? Does your life speak like the children of Israel, like Lot, walking around, whining, complaining, no testimony, living in sin, living as close to sin as possible? He lingered. This is something that struck me, Anthony, in studying this. I read earlier what Jesus said. Jesus said, listen here, child of God. When it says that Lot's wife turned back, she was turned to a pillar of salt, she didn't just go, oh, whoopsie. That word, if you study it there, she looked back, she desired the world. She looked back and longed for it. She was turned to a pillar of salt. She died. Guess what? You guys think this is hard preaching? Jesus, infinite love, said to you and me, listen, remember Lot's wife. Jesus said that. Jesus said, remember she looked back and perished. Remember she loved the world. Don't forget, remember Lot's wife. Some of you in here that you're saved and born again, I'm telling you what, some of you in here need to repent of your sin and stop playing games. Some of you in here as Christians, you're prideful. You're prideful. Sir, you're prideful. And it invites darkness. And it invites chaos. And you're prideful. And listen to me, that's why you're always offended. That's why I'm preaching now. Sir, oh, I'm preaching. Pride is always offended. That's why the praise and worship offends you because you're prideful and the light that they're walking in sheds a light on your darkness and your unwillingness to raise up a holy hand up in the house of God. Really, is that biblical? Yep. New Testament, I desire, God says to us, I desire men everywhere raise holy hands. Some of you men, you're too prideful, you can't. Some of you men in here, your life is like Lot. You lingered. No one takes you serious. Thank God that he desires for all to be saved. Anthony, me and you get to be angels this morning. Come here. I I know I won't hurt your guys' feelings. You guys come with me. Matt and Nicole. Nicole, I'm sorry. You got to be Lot's wife. I'm sorry. (laughs) Nicole's a great woman of God. Hold his hand. Anthony, stand here. Hold his hand. Nicole, come over here. Step forward, Anthony. No, you stay here. You step forward. Nicole, stay behind here. Here's Lot and his wife. Where's his, I need two daughters. Come here, girls, come on. Hurry, girls, come here quickly. I, I don't care, just two girls, get out here. All right. I want everybody to see this. Come here, girls. One on each side. Anthony, step forward. Make sure they're behind you, please. You girls stay behind. Look at me. Listen. Lot lingered. You thought Sodom and Gomorrah was about 
the judgment, listen, judgment is coming to this world and God loves everybody equally. And this story has been recounted and Jesus told us, remember Lot's wife, but he lingered and you know what the angels did? The angels, you wanna talk about grace and mercy from this book, from the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? You're looking at grace and mercy right now. You know what the angels did? There was two angels, Lot and his wife and the two daughters. Everybody look right here. The angels, as I said, took them by the hands. There's two angels. I want you to look right here at me and Anthony. We're the two angels. Our hands are full. Our hands are full. And your hands are full. My hands are full. Look at me. I want to talk to you. If you know your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, right now, I'm asking you to hold up your hand and stare at me and don't put your hand down. If you know for a fact your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, hold up your hand, don't put it down and stare at me in the eye. Listen to me. Are your hands full? Are your hands full? How do people look at your testimony? How's your ministry going? Are your hands full? The he lingered. And you know what was grace and mercy? The angels went and took him up by the hands and said, we got to get him out of here. I need you to put your hands down. We need some more of you to take up their hands. We need more of you with full hands and say, we got to get him out of here. Thank you, thank you, girls, Matt and Nicole. Everybody, if you would, bow your head and close your eyes all over this room. You can turn that up just a little bit, uh, Brother David. Father, as we pray, in Jesus' name, please finish what you've started, God. God, I'm asking you to do divine work. God, I saw some hands that were not raised. And Lord, I'm gonna be honest, I'm thankful that they're being genuine and honest. I respect that. I saw folks look me in the eye that did not raise their hands. I respect that, God. God, years ago, I couldn't have been saved. I could have been, but it was much more difficult, I believe, because I thought I already was. I've got respect for people who are honest enough to say I'm not. Father, as we're praying right now, I'm asking you, that your love, your truth, your grace and mercy would speak right now. I pray right now in Jesus' name as we're all praying, no one's looking around. If you need to be saved today, if you wanna know that today you're right with God, that you've repent, that word repent, I know we don't like it, it just means turn. If you wanna to turn to Jesus today, if you wanna be saved and give God your life today, if you wanna to know today, I'm saved, I'm born again, and my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, I wanna know it, Pastor, God's been speaking to me, He brought me here today, and I wanna get saved. If that's you, would you raise up your hand and say, pray for me, preacher. Raise up your hand quickly. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see this hand. Put them up, go ahead, don't be afraid. Put your hand up quickly. Put it up quickly. You can put it up and put it down quickly. Is there more? Say, pray for me, pastor. I see the hand. Is there anybody else? Raise it up quick. Say, pray for me, pastor. I see these hands. Pray for me, pastor. Pray for me, pastor. You can put your hands down. How many of you in here are saved, born again Christians? I'm not gonna ask you whether you think you're Abraham or Lot. I'm not gonna ask you that. But I'm just gonna ask you this. And I think that we can all pray this, Josh, no matter what camp we're in. How many of you would say, I know I'm saved and born again. And Branson, I want to walk in the promised land on this side of heaven. I want to have my hands full and not linger. If you're saved and that's you, would you raise up your hand and say, pray for me, preacher. Pray for me, preacher. Hands all over this room. You can put them down. Everybody look this way. Matt, um, as our worship team comes, as soon as they, uh, David, as soon as they start playing, you can just tune that out. Everybody look right here. Everybody look right here. Everybody do this. You with me? Everybody take one step to the left. Everybody take one step to the right. My left, your right. Listen. Hey, why'd you do that, Pastor Branson? It's such a serious moment. Because I understand right now 
there's real things at work, there's real things at play. And I understand when God is moving, the enemy and our pride and our flesh and the devil and demons and darkness and spirits and stuff that I don't see and can't understand, I don't understand at all. I do understand this, when God is moving, whether it's our pride or flesh, whatever it is, Jennifer, the enemy just comes in and clamps and puts cinder blocks on our legs and says, don't move. Look at me. We pray for God to move all the time. You can go ahead, brother. We pray for God to move all the time. And I think he's saying, I am, they won't. Christian, there was, if, if, if all the Christians that said they wanted their hands to be full, if all the Christians came forward, that wanted full hands, 80% of the audience would not be in their seats. And I, I didn't exactly count how many raised their hand for salvation. It was like 10 to 15, I'm not sure. It was a lot. I wanna say this, listen, today, listen to me. If you raised your hand for salvation, I have good news. Look at me, today's the day of salvation. You don't have to wait. You don't have to get it all figured out. The devil says, wait till you get cleaned up and get it figured out. That's a lie from the pits of hell to keep you chained up. Today, you know what God's word says to you from Romans? Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. You can call upon his name. You can ask God to forgive you and save you. You can say, God, I'm sorry. God, I know I'm a sinner. God, forgive me, save me. I give you my life. If you're born a creating Christian today, I want to encourage you to move. I want to encourage you, Psalm 34. Oh, come magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. That's a call to the assembly. Let's sing together. Let's worship together. Josh, let's come to the altars together. Let's lay hands on folks. Let's pray together. Whatever the need is, these altars are open as they lead us in worship. Won't you come? Come on. Sing it, brother. Pray.